moments uh you can turn there this is what we call the hall of fame of faith uh i love this chapter we're not gonna spend a lot of time here but i'm gonna read through it really quick because it has a lot to do with what we're doing uh on a side note and a little more on a serious note uh we would just like you guys to pray over sister lori uh, they unfortunately had to postpone their trip because uh, she got a little sick. And so just pray for her. Don't, don't bombard them with texts or anything. Just pray for them. All right, pastors, just, I'm just going to take a step out. I'm going to spend time with my wife and be a good husband. I'm like, that's important. Do that. All right. I've got, I've got today, and we'll take it day by day. But uh, just pray for her. Pray for healing. Pray she's going she's gonna to be all right. I mean, if anybody has ever had cancer in the past, you know, anytime sickness comes, then it's a little bit of a scare. So they're just taking a little bit of precautions. So just pray for them. Don't bombard them. Just pray for her and pray for healing upon her body. We love her very much. In fact, why don't we just do that? Father, I just thank you for our pastor. I thank you for our pastor's wife, Lori. Both of them have such a uh, key part in this church. And we just pray over Sister Lori right now that you just uh, heal her body, Lord, allow your will be, to be done, and just be with her right now, Father, uh, as she just overcomes this, Lord, because we know it's just, it's just one of those things we overcome, Lord. We know that you are God, and we have faith in you and what you can do. And, Lord, we just pray for them. And as they take a, a moment to rest outside of ministry as well this week, I just pray that you help them rest, both of them, uh, and then come back charged and, and fresh and as new, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Hebrews 11. We're going to dive right into this. Uh, this is something the uh, Lord actually put my heart years ago, and that's something that I went with through our students. And then I just took the thought and just shoved it into this message and put some meat on it and just worked it. So the, the thought was generated then, but it's something that the Lord brought up back to me. I'm like, man, this is so good to, to talk to our adults about. So, but we're going to start in Hebrews 11, starting in verse 1. It says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For it is our ancestors who won, won God's approval by faith. We understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. And then he goes on, the author of the Hebrews, he goes on talking about these great men of faith in the Bible. And as I read these things, and I'm, I get charged. So I just want to start this by talking about faith. Like, for instance, I mean, he mentions Abel right on. And if you look back at Abel, and you look at his life, very little bit that we have in the text because, spoiler alert, he's killed. But um, his faith is mentioned in the New Testament, and not because he did these things that were supernaturally big in the Bible. All Abel did was give the best of what he had, and he went down in the Hall of Fame of Faith. The best of what he had. I love that they start with this because this right here is so uh, easy to grab a hold of for us. Because, it, I mean, we might not split some seas in our lifetime or see some crazy things like that. Or we might. But right here, he went down in history as a man of faith because he gave the best of what he had. And I'm, I can stop there right now like, and ask ourselves, are we giving the best of what we have for the Lord? Or we give him our sloppy seconds, our sloppy thirds, whatever's left at the end of the day, or are we giving him the best of what we have? And then he goes on, talks about Enoch, who didn't experience death, taken right up. Lord, if that's a way that's available, let that be happen, you know. Uh, then he talks about Noah, who in faith, beyond his understanding, did something crazy because God directed him to. God asked him to do something. It was crazy, and he had the crazy faith to do it. He didn't let anything stop him. He didn't let the people in the, in the village who chastised him and do all this thing as he's preparing for something that's never happened before. And he talks about, no, he talks about Abraham who went down in the Bible as a father of faith who simply did what God told him to do. Right. Simply did that. And God would talk to him and said, I want you to go to that city. Okay. The next morning, he'd pack everything up first thing in the morning, and he'd go. He didn't ask, uh, Lord, what route do you want me to take? Uh, can we wait till next week? I got a pedicure Monday. Uh, he, didn't ask, he didn't do anything like that. He said, very first thing in the morning, he gets up, and he goes. And this was his life, and God blessed him as the father of faith. And then you can even see him with Isaac and his faith there. 
But, uh, and then you move on. He talks about Sarah, according to the word, was past her baby bearing years. She had enough faith to see through, uh, see through it. As a result, scripture says she came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and innumerable as grains of the sand along the seashore. First of all, I wasn't going to say this, but I will say it. I'm sorry, ladies, that the only place in the hall of faith is baby bearing. Sorry. I'm just saying that's, this is the back in the, the old Testament, new Testament, that's the culture, but the reality all through scripture, women rose up and did some incredible things of faith. Uh, so I'll just, just side note, uh, Moses, he left a place. I mean, he, he had everything. He had all the riches, all this kind of stuff. And of course the whole murder thing happened and then he, he booked it, but he, after he booked it, he was in a place of peace and comfort. He's just, you know, doing his thing. And then God called him to do something big and, and get out of his comfort zone and go free the Israelites. And he did it. Did he do it begrudgingly? A little bit, right? But did he complain a little bit at the beginning? A little bit. But still, by faith, he did these incredible things. And then verse 32 continues right there in chapter 11. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouth of lions, quenched the raging of fires, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. And you read about all these people and what they've accomplished. You read it all through Scripture. And then you sit here and, first of all, faith changes things. Faith, we read about men and events like these, and we think, wow, they did some incredible things as if God has implanted, not, or has, as if God has not implanted the same plan and skill and spirit within us to do the same stuff. But we look at this and like, wow, this is so amazing. And I read it, I'm like, yes, that's who I want to be. I want to be this incredible man of faith that could move mountains, that could do these crazy things. I want from 2,000 years from now that God says, all right, let's do a Bible 2.0 in the Hall of Faith. There's Joseph, bam, you know, that'd be great. I want, I want, I have a desire for God to do such incredible things. Who cares? Don, David wrestled a lion. I want the Bible to say that Joseph juggled a pair, a few lions, you know, forget the Red Sea. I want to say Joseph, you know, he split the Atlantic Ocean. Come on. I mean, I want to be a man of faith that, that is recorded that look what Jesus did through a man of faith. And you know what scripture tells us that we can move mountains, we can do all these incredible things. Yet I look around and I'm like, what are we doing? What mountains are we moving? What's, what's happening in our life? We get a little scared sometimes and it completely wrecks us. Right? And I, I just want to come to this place right here um, and, and become and embrace every bit of faith that the Lord has instilled in me that I can have. In the second Corinthians 13, five, Paul tells us to test yourself to see if you are in the faith, examine yourself. So that's what I want to do this morning. I want us to examine ourselves and our faith to see, make sure that we are living in such a way that we have this authentic faith that will mount, move mountains in our life that will split seas in our life, that will do these incredible things because the reality is we are holding ourselves back because we're believing in something that's not actually first scriptural but not very evident in our life. And I'm going to be a little bit honest with you. Uh, the few things I'm going to go over are a little bit convicting. And I went back and forth. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be a convictor. And the Lord says, you're not, I am. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll share your word and share truth. And so I'll, I say that to say, if you feel convicted by any of this stuff, that's a great thing. Why is that a great thing? It's uncomfortable. Yes, it's a great thing because if God did not have a plan for you, he wouldn't waste his time convicting you. It means he has something for you. He, he wants you to be in a place of growth and do something in your life that will move some mountains, that will do these incredible things, but it's just on the other side of how we deal with that conviction, right? So we have to come to this place right here as we talk about these things to the Lord, what are you going to do? The obstacle right here is that we allow our faith to be directional, and we often stop the momentum of our lives because we stop and change it into something that it shouldn't be. 
And I want to present with you three twisted versions of faith that will rob us of the destiny God has for us. So three twisted versions of faith that we sometimes embrace in our own lives. And you're going to see a little bit yourself and maybe all three of them or at least one of them. I know I did as I'm going through this. I'm just as convicted as you are in some areas. And the first one, we're going to start in Matthew 14. This uh, set of scriptures and I went back and forth, and I prayed, Lord, give me something else that's a little bit different, because I feel like we tackle this, this scripture a lot, or this story a lot. But he kept coming back and saying, no, this is exactly what you need to talk about. So here we go. Matthew 14, and starting in verse 24. Yeah. Meanwhile, the boat was already some, di- some distance from land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. Jesus came toward them, them being the disciples, on a boat, Jesus told them to go along. They did. Storms come. And here Jesus starts coming, walking up. Jesus came toward them walking on the sea very early in the morning. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, have courage, you idiots. No, he didn't say that. He said, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if you, Peter, if it is you, Peter answered, command me to come to the, come on the water. He said, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. One of the incredible moments in the Bible. And so, but when he saw the strength of the wind, he, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out with his hand, caught hold of him and said, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got in the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshiped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. This is an incredible story, and we can find it very relatable. And in fact, the first twist of the faith that we come to is what we're calling circumstantial faith. It's when our faith is, is uh, determined by the circumstances in our life rather than Jesus. Because Peter was in a boat, he asked Jesus, all right, tell me to come on the water. He did, right? He was in a great place and a great relationship with Jesus at that moment. He was connected to the Father, and he stepped out, and all of a sudden, what did he do? He took his eyes off of Christ, and he began to sink. He was afraid. He saw the wind. He saw the circumstances. He saw everything around him that freaked him out. And because of that, instead of keeping his eyes on Christ, who's already done so much in front of his very eyes, he took his eyes and put it on the circumstances around him, and he began to sink. Circumstantial faith is the measure of my faith is determined by the measure of my circumstances. When we let the things around us determine how much faith we're going to have in the Lord, right? Circumstantial faith says if we don't see God at work in our immediate circumstances, we lose confidence in him. Or we don't, when we don't get the job we want, when someone we love gets sick, when the pandemic hits, when these things go down, we start losing faith in the Lord because of the circumstances that are around us. I mean, we can relate to that sometimes. When it gets very real for us, then we start doubting. But when it's not real for other people, we're like, why, why didn't he just have faith? The Lord's going to do this. And we're great about giving advice to other people. But when it hits home for us, it changes things. When obstacles begin to take place and our circumstances aren't favorable, we run back to our default in relying on ourselves and not trusting in the Lord. You know, four times, actually four or five times in Scripture in the New Testament, Jesus says, you of little faith. In fact, all of them were to his disciples, every one of them. And these are men that that claim to love him and do these sayings and all this stuff. And he tells them, Matthew 6, 30, he says it after he's telling his disciples not to worry about their life. They're sitting there complaining about the things they're going to wear, the life. He said, don't worry about all this, what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, you of little faith. Matthew 8, 36, disciples were afraid because they were in a storm in another boat, right? The storms are going and, and he's sleeping the bottom, he says, you have little faith. Another time, he rebukes them for worrying. They're worrying about their bad circumstances, what they're going to do. He says, you of little faith. Uh, Matthew 16, 8, the disciples were worried about not having enough bread to feed everybody. He said, you of little faith. Every one of those instances are times that they were worried about their circumstances, and their circumstances changed their view and their faith and their hope in the Lord, and they stopped relying on the Lord and start focusing on the circumstances. 
And he's trying to get them to understand that our faith in him should not be filtered through our circumstances. Think about it. What if circumstantial faith was the norm in the Bible? Well, David would never have become king, right? Joseph would have died in prison. Moses would still be lost in the wilderness. Noah would have been in a, in a half-built boat, right? Uh, Jonah would have stayed in the belly of a fish. Job would have lost everything for nothing. And it goes on and on. Peter sinks the moment he shifts his direction and focuses on the circumstances in his life. You cannot let your circumstances define your faith. And I can say that all day long, but until we brace that truth, we're going to continue to let the world wreck us. All right, then we get to the next one. We've got circumstantial faith. Everybody say circumstantial faith. Thank you. The next one we find in uh, Matthew 19. This is the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, so he gets approached. Jesus gets approached right here. Uh, and then verse 16, just then someone came up and asked him, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he asked him, Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbors as yourself. And he gets excited, he says, I have done all these, the young man said. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, which there's a lesson in that, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, then come, follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. So he was a man who checked all the boxes, but when the Lord says, I want your heart, he turns around and walks away. This faith is what I call transactional faith. It's the, the measure of my faith is determined by God giving me the blessings I feel I deserve. Transactional faith. My commitment to him is transactional. And the goods I receive is God's blessings. This is something that we have a tendency of doing, whether we admit it or not. We, we try to look, do all the right things. We try to look the part. We try to talk the parts. But our, our heart is not for him. We're not pressing toward. We're not truly surrendering. We only surrender what's convenient to us. Right? We surrender just the things on the outside rather than the things internally. You know what this does? It turns our relationship into Jesus into a job. If we put in the hours, we will get paid, right? If I show up Sunday, then I'm good, right? Check it off my list. I'm a great Christian. I, I go to church every Sunday. Well, where is your heart? There's a difference between a contract and a covenant. Sometimes Some of us have a contract with Jesus, right? We, we do all the things for him, and we expect to receive all the blessings. Like what is owed to us versus a covenant, which is a true devotion between us and God. Transactional faith, I'm a good person because I check all the right boxes and God should bless me for it. It's okay if I lie a little because I'm a good person in all the other areas of my life. Why does this happen to me? I have been consistently going to church. Heard that one many times. Why am I dealing with this? I... I I go to church every Sunday. When the doors are open, I'm there. Then why is God doing this to me? It's because we're treating him like our boss at our job, and we're expecting. On a side note, Bethany did tell me I should bring a box of Band-Aids here and give every single one of us because we're going to need to put it on us because of the conviction. But I said, no, we better not do that. But It was a good idea. So there's this older lady named Penny. She had a cantankerous old husband named Lou. Anyways, Penny and Lou didn't talk very much. They, they were married for a long time, and they just do their own thing. And so Penny was really lonely. She said, oh, you know what? I'm going to go down to the PetSmart and get me a parrot who will talk to me. So she goes down to PetSmart. She goes in there. She buys a parrot, brings it home. Two days later, she shows back at PetSmart, and she tells the person, this parrot's not talking to me. You gave me a broken bird. What's going on? He's like, oh, that's strange. I'll tell you what, get one of those ladders and put it in the, uh, not, I was going to say fish tank. Wow. Bird cage. Thank you. Uh, put it in a bird cage and he'll go up and down. He'll really enjoy it and he'll begin to talk. Maybe he's just scared. 
She's like, okay. And she buys that and she puts it in the, the tank or the what tank. I got a court patient. We went to the aquarium yesterday, so it's, it's all in my head. Put it in the bird cage. And two days later, she comes back to PetSmart and says, hey, you gave me a broken bird. It's still not. Like, oh, that's strange. Still not talking to you. Okay, I'll tell you what. Get one of those swings and put it at the top of the cage. And it'll jump on there and it'll like life a little bit more. And, and it'll talk to you. She's like, okay. So she did this. Two days later, she comes back to PetSmart angry she's like you gave me a broken bird what is going on it's like still not talking that's really strange right uh get this mirror and put the mirror in the cage and maybe if it starts looking at itself and get more confidence start talking to you it's like okay and she puts it in the puts it in the cage she comes back four days later and and the guy sees her and says how's the bird doing well the bird's dead like the bird is dead what are you talking about like did it ever talk and she said yeah it said why didn't you ever buy bird seed you dummy <laughs> anyways <laughs> all on a side note the reality of our faith even in this story is that we buy all the right things we do all the right things but we miss out on the food of life and giving ourselves to him Right? We give him everything else, but not what he genuinely wants, which is our heart and our surrender. Right? Jesus met with Nicodemus in John 3. He was a pharisaical leader and saw something different in Jesus. Right? He was stuck in his tradition, stuck in the law, but he saw Jesus. He said, there's something different about that Jesus. And so he asked Jesus, can we meet outside of normal hours so people don't know I'm talking to you? So they met one evening, and Jesus shared the gospel, and he had this great conversation, but he could not break down the walls of his traditional heart, and he missed out. He missed it. Right? Because he's always used his relationship with the Lord like a big transaction. And when anything else presented in his life, he couldn't deal with it, so he just walked away. There's many of us just walking away from our faith because we're not getting what we feel like we deserve. And our relationship with Jesus isn't about what we deserve because what we deserve is eternal damnation, right? What we deserve is not heaven. What we deserve is everything but. But we don't treat God like that. Right? I mean, I'm a good person. I do these things. I go to church. I lead Bible study for four. I do all of these things. And God says, well, when did you start doing this? When did you surrender your heart? You can, you can be transactional and do all the right things, but you're missing out here. You cannot let your faith become a job. And the third twisted faith here is what I call, bear, bear with me here, lazy faith. So old lady Penny, right, after her bird and all that kind of stuff, she she went to the store. She was really hungry. So she went to the store to to get some food, and she got in the store. She drove all the way there, got in the store. She was really hungry, and she realized she left her wallet at home. Anybody been there? She was there. Okay. Uh, So she went in there, and she's like, you know, but I'm really hungry. I don't feel like getting in my car and going back to my house. So she looks around the store. She grabs a can of peaches and puts it in her purse and takes off so she's in her car she opened that can starts eating it and then the security guard came out caught her busted all that stuff they press charges she finds herself in front of a judge and the judge like what did you steal she said a can of peaches so why did you steal a can of peaches she said i was hungry all right and the judge started thinking about looking at her said how many peaches were in that can she said, how many peaches? What, are you, what does that matter? She said, seven. She's like, okay. Or the judge says, okay, I will give you seven days in jail for, every, for a day for every peach. And she started looking. And then there was a hand that went in the very back of the room. And the judge said, yes, you back there. It was Lou, her husband. And he stood up and said, she also stole a can of peas. <laughs> If Penny would just got back in her car and went home and eat, ate something, she would have been fine. And this is how we treat faith sometimes. Listen, this is how we can't get too lazy in our faith that we miss out on what God is showing us. God, God, getting too comfortable can rob us of our faith. This is how we define lazy faith. The measure of my faith is determined by my comfort level. Lazy faith ignores opportunity because it makes them feel uncomfortable. 
Lazy faith produces a lack of passion or motivation to be about the Father's business. Lazy faith produces a list of excuses as to why we can't, why we can't before we are even asked. Lazy faith produces a professional justifier. It ignores the reality of hell and the urgency of salvation. Lazy faith sometimes is often a result of mismanaged guilt and conviction. When the Lord puts something on our heart and does things, we either embrace it, embrace the growth, or we walk away from it because we're too lazy to deal with it, right? We shift our whole belief system just because it's more convenient for us to do that than deal with what's really going on in our heart. Revelations 3.15 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Uh, so because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's some bold words. But God didn't die for us to be lukewarm, right? He didn't die for us to have lazy faith. I had a student years ago who speaks, spoke so much truth on this. She said, the enemy loves us to be in a place of just enough. Because it's in that place that we don't accomplish anything for the kingdom, right? We do just enough to make ourselves satisfied, to make us feel like a good Christian. We don't pursue the Father. We don't pursue his word. We don't seize opportunities to shine through the week. We don't uh, look for oppor opportunities, period. We don't tell anybody about him. We have, listen, we have the key to the kingdom in our lives. Jesus is the key to the kingdom. Our faith, salvation is the key to the kingdom. We have the key, but in lazy faith, it's in a junk drawer with a bunch of cords, old phones, and old extension cords that we haven't seen in years. And that's where we place the key to the kingdom because we're too lazy to take it out and do something with it. Right? We've gotten a little too comfortable in the church. We've gotten a little too comfortable with our faith and not, I mean, you, again, we, we read back at the beginning of Hebrews 11, all these men, women who do this incredible stuff. But you know what? We have more of an opportunity to do greater things because not only do we have the Lord behind us, but we have the Holy Spirit in us that allows us to do incredible things. But we're just sitting on the sideline, just surviving. We're not wrecking this world. We should be wrecking this world for the Lord. We should be doing these incredible things. You've all got crazy mountains in your life that need to be moved. And he says, just a faith the size of a mustard seed will change that for you. But we are sometimes too lazy. Sometimes we treat our, our relationship like a job. Sometimes we're so involved in the circumstances around us that we're missing it. We're missing it. These three types of faith really come down to this. We place more faith in ourselves than we do in Jesus. I check the necessary boxes, but my heart is far from him. This sounds really familiar. In fact, Jesus had something similar to say to the Pharisees. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's a convicting truth, right? Right? We come in here, we're really good about worship, we're really good about holding our hands up, we're really good about this, but as soon as we leave this place, those hands go right back, right? And we go back to how we are comfortable in our faith rather than moving the mountains. Which brings us to the fourth and most important thing, authentic faith. This, the measure of our faith, is determined by Jesus alone. We can make plans, we can strategize, we can read a verse a day, talk enough to people, talk about how to accomplish and what we feel faith be, uh, but it would all come up short. You can't strategize your faith. Faith is a total surrender to Jesus alone. You can build on your faith after that, but it has to be on Jesus alone. By the foundation of authentic faith, the, the foundation of it is Jesus alone. It's not the circumstances, it's not transactional, it's not all these things, it's not our own comfort, it's in Jesus alone. I was, uh, yesterday I went to the aquarium, took my family to the aquarium for a day, had a good family day. Looking, walk through, looking at all the fish, yes, it's beautiful, beautiful, and then we walk and there's a tiger. That doesn't make any sense to me, I don't know. There was a tiger in an aquarium, I mean not in an aquarium, that would be pretty interesting to watch, but... Uh, no, just in a cage at the aquarium, and it was beautiful, and it was majestic, and I was just, the kids were running around, and I just sat there, and I was just looking at that tiger. I thought, almost pitying it a little bit. I'm just like, 
that thing is so majestic and beautiful. And it's there to sleep in because it has nothing to do. It's so beautiful and majestic, but none of it is seen or embraced because it's locked down between four walls. The crazy thing is, that's us and our faith. We have all this potential to move mountains and do these great things, but we put walls all the way around us with this twisted faith that we've created. And it's holding us back. Anytime our faith is in anything other than the person of Christ, then faith is weakened. Circumstantial faith focuses on our environment. Transactional faith focused on me. Lazy faith focused on my comfort. But authentic faith is focused on Jesus alone. I don't know. Is McKenna, you're around? She can hear me? Oh, there you are. Come on up. So, yes, this week, I had a gentleman call me. He's a good friend of mine. I won't say his name or anything, but uh, he called me and said, hey, can we talk? And it was like 8.30 one night, 9 o'clock. I'm like, yeah. So he drove by. We sat on our porch. He started talking to me. We were talking about something else, but then he started talking about this, and I'm like, wow. He had no idea what I was going to talk about today. But he says, I was at work. And, and to see where he's come for, so far in his life, uh, from so, he was so insecure and he struggled with his faith and all this kind of stuff, to where he is now, where he just lives it, right? He just lo- genuinely loves the Lord. He loves his word. He loves his truth. He just, he's been, and at work, he's the same way. He goes to work. He's not afraid to tell people about Jesus. He's constantly opening his word. And, and people take notice of that. Right? People recognize that. And he says, I was just sitting at work. I was reading my Bible. And he said, one of the employees came up to me. He says, listen, I know you're a man of faith. I know you love the Lord. My, my daughter's sick. I just need you to pray for her. And he's like, wow, what an opportunity. I mean, a lot of us, because of that, we would walk, oh, I'm not very comfortable. This is out of my comfort zone. Let's not do that. No, he's like, yes, please, let's pray. But he begins to pray for him. He does that. And then his boss came up to him afterwards. And his boss said, you can't do that. And he said, excuse me? He said, you can't be praying for people like that in your your job. He said, first of all, I did not approach him. He approached me. And I will never deny someone a prayer if they ask. Not only that, he says, and if you make me, I'm not afraid to leave. He said, I'll go pack up my stuff right now and leave. He's like, don't you want your job? He's like, yeah, I like my job. But nothing's going to get in, in the way of my relationship with the Lord. He said, God will get me another job. I'm going to honor him with my life. And threw his boss completely off. He's like, uh, okay, go ahead. Authentic faith, not letting anything rob you of your relationship with the Lord. If Christ is who he says he is, then we do not have to worry when bad things happen. If Christ really died for the sins of this world, then we do do not, or then we have no reason to doubt his love. If Christ is coming back for us and we have the confidence of that, then we have to know that he has our best interest in mind. If we truly believe in Christ, then we have no excuse than to totally surrender our lives and submit to him. If this is all true and this is the foundation of our faith, then we have to test and make sure our faith is not a checklist of what to do or not to do. It's not living in mediocrity anymore. It's not the foundation of our faith is, uh, is put on all these other things. It is simply put on Christ and Christ alone. If our faith and hope rests on anything other than the person of Christ, then we are building our life again upon fragile foundation. The foundation of our faith cannot rest in our ability to figure out the mysteries of life. Our faith cannot be rest on or rest on our ability to figure out how everything fits together. It cannot be on how consistently things go our way. It cannot be on how closely God follows our plan for our life. It cannot be on whether or not God answers our prayer. He is not our personal genie. He is God. He does not exist for you. You exist for him. The foundation of faith must be Jesus. Twisted faith is allowing anything in our lives to determine the amount of faith we have in Jesus. But read this. Real life-changing 
momentum building, monumental moving faith is not allowing our life to determine the measure of our faith, but allowing our faith to determine the measure of our life. That's the right formula for faith. It dictates our circumstances. It dictates our opportunities. It dictates the places in life that we go. When we align to this truth, that's when things start changing. Jesus tells us in Matthew 17, if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Let me ask you, what mountains are being moved in your life? Pastor Joseph, I'm just trying to survive today. Listen, Jesus didn't live die, rise, and implant the Holy Spirit in you for you just to to survive this world. He did all of this so that you can thrive in this world and move mountains and show people the crazy power of our God who loves unconditionally. Not for us just to live in our comfort zone the rest of our life. You know what faith really looks like? It's very simple. This is not just a Sunday morning act of worship. This is a symbolic view of what a life should look like. You know why we raise our hands and we do this in worship? It's a form of surrender. It's the most vulnerable place that we can be in surrendering ourselves to the Lord. And again, we do this on Sundays. We're really good about worshiping the Lord. But as soon as Monday comes, then we're back here. God wants us completely surrendered to Him. Completely surrendered. He doesn't want your leftovers. He wants your whole heart. He wants your whole faith. He wants all of you. Let me tell you, it's a mountain moving, lion wrestling, water splitting, giant killing, death overcoming, sickness healing, trail, trial overcoming, crazy things happening, city saving, sacrificial living, miracle making kind of faith. He said that is instilled in each of you. It's in you already. Listen, the reality is, is there's already a flame in your heart. God put that in a long time ago, but it's up to you whether how hot that flame gets. It is up to you. Listen, and sometimes, and even in me, we come up short in this. We see it in the disciples, and we think, you know, well, I'm, I'm living this lazy faith. This is who I am. That was who the disciples were for a season. But something shifted because if it didn't, as soon as Jesus died, they would have stayed on the water fishing. They wouldn't have done anything for the Lord. And then they saw the Lord, and the Lord touched their hearts, and they finally gave them their full selves, and it drastically changed everything. We're here reading God's word because 12 men decided, you know what? I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna have circumstantial faith anymore. I'm not going to have transactional faith anymore. I'm just going to stop being lazy. I'm going to give God everything I have. Just like Abel, he gave the best of what he had. You don't have to have all the money in the world. You don't have to have all the resources in the world. All you have to do is give God the best that you have. That's it. And it's this. It's living life in such a way that you recognize from the morning you wake up to the time you go to bed that He is your God and He is in charge. Not only that, but He loves you so much and you just want to spend time with Abba Father. You want to surrender to Him. He is it. Can we do something? Could you just stand with me? McKenna's going to sing this song again. I love this song. In fact, this song has been her the other day because it embodies what we're talking about here. He has good plans. He has everything that, he has a vision for your life that's greater than anything you could ever put together and the only thing that's blocking you is your faith. That's the reality. Right? He's got so many things for you. He's got mountains that's already moved in his mind. He's just waiting for you to have the faith to walk through them. And so I just want her to sing this song again and I just want you to just be in the moment Surrender yourself to the Lord. And if 
I would even encourage you guys to be in a posture of submission. Don't look around. Don't worry about other people. I would even encourage you to get away from your seat because sometimes when we stay in the same place, then we symbolically do that in our lives. Like, That's a great message. Oh, Joseph, a great message. And we go home and do the exact same thing over and over and over. We need to shift ourselves, shift our posture, and submit to the Lord. He has great plans. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you want to live that? Do you want that kind of faith that will move mountains, that will do crazy things, that will go down in the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews 11? Do you want that kind of faith? That's the kind of faith I want. And it requires us to move. It requires us to do something. So just as she's singing this song, I want you to be in a posture of submission. I'm not going to force you. You don't have to feel like you have to. But if that's a place where God has you, I want you to move somewhere else in this room. It could be up here. It could be down the hall. I don't care. But just shift yourself and sing this song with her and declare that he has great plans. He has something for you that's greater than anything you could ever imagine. But you have to put yourself in that place. Right? He's already put the flame in your heart. It's time for you to start building on that. It's time for you to start flaming up that fire and doing something so that this city can be changed that your home can be changed that this country can be changed listen it's not going to be in Washington it's going to be right here it's going to be right here and it starts with you Father it's all for you and as we sing this song Father it's all for you
robbing ourselves of this constantly. You of little faith. Lord, let us have a mom monumental kind of faith. Lord, we trust you, Father. We say that, but I pray that we live that. We come in here and we worship you and we say we well, have great plans, Father, but let us not only say that, but live that tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday. Let us live in such a way that mountains are being moved everywhere. When people see what's going on, they cannot doubt that it's the God of the universe working through us. There's mountains all in this room, Father, all in our lives. There's so much going on in this world, and we get so overwhelmed with it, and it breaks us down, Father. But Lord, thank you that you hold us up. Let us not be overcome by our circumstances, but let us approach our circumstances with a crazy faith that will change things. We say that in expectation, the reality of what is hoped for, which means the things that we hope for can be our reality in faith. Lord, let us live in such a way somebody here that doesn't know you that today they will reposture their lives and surrender themselves to you that is a very personal thing I'm not going to make a spectacle out of that right in this moment Father but to give them the courage to reposture themselves to surrender to you and then give them the boldness to talk to somebody about it because we cannot do this alone we were never meant to do this what is hope for that is your week listen don't let this just be another good oh, great message pastor that was a great no it's got to start it's got to do something we got to move some mountains we got to do something right he's already did all the hard work for us he died on the cross right we get to plant seeds we get to we get to celebrate what he did the reality of what is hope for you, you know, really grab a hold of what that means. The, the things that you hope for the Lord puts in your heart, it's a reality. It's not just things that we're hoping is going to happen. Our faith can make it a reality because of what he's done for you. And it's all about him. I encourage you guys to celebrate that this week. To change something. To pray like you've never prayed before. what's hoped for. He's already got it. He's already done it. You just got to walk through it. That's the amazing thing about God. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Appreciate you guys being here. We can have the uh, servant leaders come forward. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to give, which also requires an authentic faith, knowing that your God's got you as you give. And it's a scary place to be sometimes. I've been there. I grew up with a family that just put the bare minimal in the tray every Sunday because we didn't have the faith that God was going to do something in our life, I guess. We just, it's our comfort level. It's our circumstantial faith. It's our lazy faith. We'll just do the bare minimal because that checks off the box for us. The reality is that we have to give just like our faith, right? We have to have an authentic faith and trust. Give him our very best and trust that God's going to take care of us. Uh, tithe and offering envelopes are behind the you know where they are. All right, let's say this together. 
as we give today, living God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates, returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. Give it up for Pastor Joseph.